Well, good morning. All right, my name is Walt Tanner, one of the pastors here at Capstone. It is cold and rainy, and we are glad that you are joining us here uh, in person, or if you're joining us online and you guys are uh, comfy watching from your, uh, wherever you're watching, whether it's on the couch or uh, at the dining room table or wherever, uh, and we are finishing up our unprecedented series. And so uh, we have talked about how in 2020 this, this uncommon word became common, uh, and we really kind of the point of this was uh, this word of unprecedented, when we hear that, we heard it a lot in 2020, we're hearing it in 2021 as well, and the idea that we think about the gospel when we hear about unprecedented, because the truth is, when you take the definition of unprecedented, which means never seen before, you, you take Christ's life and his ministry and his message, and, and it checks all the boxes. That when Christ came, the world had never seen him, they had never heard this message, they had never experienced these, these miracles, and then as he goes to the cross and he tells about the salvation that comes not through works and through deeds, but comes through his blood and through, through his sacrifice and through his obedience, that Jesus, again, checks all those boxes. And the truth is, is why we should not be so caught up in the unprecedented things that we are experiencing, because God was not shocked by anything that happened in 2020. And reality is, is, is that's who we should run to. That's who we should lean on. The one who isn't shocked or who is, he was unwavered through political unrest or through, uh, through global pandemics or any of the things that we're experiencing, social uh, unrest, or whatever it is, the idea that God is the one we should be looking to in that. And so as we talk about that, we said in week one that we had this unprecedented, uh, this unprecedented identity in Christ and reality, we've said this again and again and again over the last three weeks, but the idea is this, is that we have to die to ourselves and that our identity is not in us, but in the one who has given himself for us. And the truth is we should probably be reminded 365 days, which is probably Jesus said this in Luke 9, 35, if you want to write this down. Jesus says, look, if you want to be my disciple, you need to die to yourself daily. You need to, as he says, pick up your cross daily. We said Galatians 2.20 is, a, is, a, is one of my life verses. It's one of the verses that as long as I'm on stage and you're in a small group with me or I'm being discipled by you or you're hanging out with me, you'll hear this verse again and again and again and again. Galatians 2.20. For I have been crucified with Christ and no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live, I live in Christ. I pick up my cross daily. It's no longer my wants and my desires, but how does Christ want to live through me? How can I be his hands? How can I be his feet? How can I be an ambassador? As we said, how can we be an extension of Jesus Christ and his gospel? And so that was week one of our identity is not in ourselves and our desires, but we have died to those things and we now live for Christ. And we, we said this a lot, the idea there's a big difference between a church goer and a Christ follower. A church goer doesn't pick up that cross. They just kind of go through the motions. They check the boxes. But the idea that we are a Christ follower is that I'm willing to go where Christ calls me to go. I'm willing to say what Christ calls me to say. I will do what Christ calls me to do in my identity in Christ. Last week, we talked about this unprecedented calling to live as a family. That in our society and culture right now, it is very easy just to want to go to church to make friends but ultimately, Christ says, look, I didn't go to the cross for you to be a part of a Sunday social club. I, I did not go to the cross for you to be moral and good people. I went to the cross to give myself and to ultimately the blood that covers our sins to unite us as a family. He calls us brothers and sisters. He says, look, it's great that you come to church and it's great that you have, a, uh, you, you have people and friends, but reality is, is you are called to be a family. You are called to be brothers and sisters. And we confessed last week, that is not easy. It is much easier to be friends and to have associates and acquaintances at church. But the idea that if we're really a family, it's the idea that we have uncomfortable conversations, that, that we're not just hanging out in the, in the shallow end, but we're going in the deep end. We're just not having surface conversations, but we are digging deep. There's intimacy. And, and so that's really, really hard. But Christ says, look, if you're living this thing out, you have a calling to be a family, and that's how we're going to accomplish this. And so again, our family is our anchor in the foundation of Christ. So if we begin to drift, because we're not just doing it by ourselves, just because we're not with friends and acquaintances, but we truly have a family, when they see us drift and they care about us, they bring us back. They're anchored in the foundation of Christ. 
We talked about how that's so important in our society today. And yes, it is messy and it is tough, but it makes us stronger. It makes us more compassionate. It makes us more like Jesus to have family other than just friends. And so as we talk about what that looks like, again, are you here to make friends? Are you here to be a part of a family? If you missed those first two weeks, we encourage you to go to our YouTube channel or, or the app. You can, you can check out those messages. So today we're finishing up. We've said reality is there's three relationships that Christ did and models for us. There's the up, the idea that God says, Jesus says the greatest commandments are love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. So we need to be connected to the one who has created us. So there's the up, which we would say that's our identity. Then last week we said there's this in, which is our church family, love your neighbor as yourself. Our neighbor is our, our brothers and sisters in Christ. But then there's another piece of that, which is the lost, which those who are far from the Lord. That's what we're going to talk about today, the idea of going, hey, what does it mean to, to have relationships with people who necessarily don't go to church? And what does it mean to have relationships with people who are far from the Lord? And that we see Christ model that for us. So for Christ's followers, that's what we need to do. So we're going to be in Luke uh, 18. So if you have your word, whether you're watching online or here in person, we encourage you to open up, uh, whether it's the Bible or the app that you have. Remember the beauty of technology is you can have God's word with you at all times in any translation that you like, whether you're King James, ESV, or New Living, whatever you are, you can uh, con connect with that on uh, your app. So we're going to be in Luke 18. We're going to read two stories, one in Luke 18, one in Luke 19. We probably heard these stories separately. Um, there's not many times we've heard, I've ever heard these, these stories parallel with each other. Uh, it's about money and it's about richness. It's about people who follow rules and people who don't follow rules and salvation and who Jesus hangs out with and ultimately who gets it. Who gets it? And ultimately, we're going to see, and today, our main thing is we're talking about, we've talked about unprecedented identity, unprecedented calling. Today is unprecedented action, all right? Unprecedented action in word and in deed. So what is it like for us to live out the gospel? Just not hang out with church people, just not uh, spend time in, in Bible study, but to truly take that gospel and share it in word and deed. So we're going to be in Luke 18, verse 18, and this is the story called The Young Rich Ruler. And this was not a parable. This is an actual conversation that Jesus has with someone. So Jesus says, a young, uh, and verse 18 says, A young ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of eternal life? What must I do to get into heaven? What do I need to get out of the hell free card? All right? What do I need to get into heaven? All right? Here we go. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I've kept from my youth. So, so this guy is, is a good guy. He follows all the rules. He goes to church. And, and he says, hey, Jesus, what do I need to get into heaven? And he just kind of smiles and shakes his head because that's the wrong question. The wrong question is, what do I need, is not what I need to do into heaven. What do I need to really experience? Just not life here on earth but to spend eternity with the one who created me. Just not, I, I just don't want to get out of hell. I really want to experience life into its fullest. So Jesus says, hey, you know what? Here's what you need to do. You need to follow all the rules of the law. Remember the Old Testament and the law? And, and I re really believe Jesus is listing those out, and, and this guy interrupts him. This guy interrupts him. Now, this guy is kind. He is compassionate. He, you, he says, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. So he knows all the things to do, and, and Jesus patiently smiles. And, and as, as this guy answers, hey, I follow all the rules. I, I'm a good church kid. I, I imagine Jesus holding up this one finger. He says, hold up. There's still one thing. You didn't let me finish. There's still one thing that you need to do. And that's the next verse. You see it in verse uh, 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, he said, one thing. One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And Come. And follow me. So Jesus is clear. He answers his question. Here's the invitation. Hey, come follow me. So Jesus says, he says, come follow me. He says, and here's the challenge. There's always, cha there's always invitation, always challenge. The challenge is, is that you sell everything. Now, what is the response? But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus sees, uh, Jesus seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of of God. So uh, Jesus knew this was a good kid. He followed all the rules. So he says, hey, let me get, let me get right to the meat of the matter. Let, let's get right to it, all right? Here's the deal. You're a good kid. You follow all the rules, but there's still one thing you lack. He says, let's get, Jesus knew that the idol that was in him, it was his stuff. 
So Jesus ultimately puts the challenge in front of him and says, hey, do you love your stuff or do you want to have a savior? Do you want to pick up your cross and follow me? Which for this guy meant putting all his riches aside to follow him. Now, some people interpret this. It means that we can't have nice things. It says, you know, the, how hard is it for the rich, the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Ultimately, it's not, stuff isn't what matters. It's that do you love your stuff more than your savior? And so this guy ultimately says, look, I do care more about my stuff than my savior. He wasn't willing to pick up his cross. He was willing to follow rules. He was willing to go to church. He was willing to do the things he was supposed to do. But when it came to sacrifice and his actions... He wasn't willing to do that. Too many churches, especially in the South, because everybody's saved in the South. My grandma went to church. I went to vacation Bible school. They follow the rules. They're willing to go and do the things they need to quote unquote do, like this guy. But when it comes to sacrifice, they're not willing. Because ultimately, his actions revealed what he worshiped. His actions revealed what he worshiped. His actions revealed that he cared more about rules and his stuff than sacrifice and a savior. Now, some of us need to hear that because some of us get more caught up in following rules than following Jesus. If we were an amen in church, we'd amen right there, right? Y'all can go ahead and amen right there. All right, there we go. That was your prompt too when I say that. That's your prompt too. All right, so here we go. All right, so that, amen, because we care more about following rules than we follow Jesus. So we get more consumed that I'm doing, quote, unquote, the right thing as opposed to going, what does Jesus actually want me to do? Why? Because I'm picking up my cross and I am following him. I am crucified. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So here we see this picture of this young rich ruler who follows all the rules, who looks like the perfect candidate for church, perfect candidate to be a Christ follower, perfect candidate to get baptized. Like He's following all the rules. He is good on the outside. But yet when it came to piercing the inside, Jesus says he, he didn't have it. He, he, now, when I preach this, I really pray that he come back the next day. I pray that he went to sleep and said, you know what? This is stupid. My stuff does not matter. My, my stuff is not more important than my Savior. I pray that we see him in heaven. I really do. So now let's jump over to Luke 19. Similar story of a rich guy, but this time he is, he is not moral. He is a tax collector, which means tax collectors in these days were the crookedness of the crooks, especially a Jewish tax collector. So, so this guy is a Jewish tax collector. So one, he's betraying his nationality because he's working for Rome, the oppressors. He's collecting taxes for Rome, and Rome basically said, hey, get us our taxes, and if you want anything, you can lie and steal and cheat and get whatever what you want. So most tax collectors were very wealthy because they would take off the top before they, and, and they would get their own. They would lie, and, and, and so, so tax collectors were, were notorious sinners. And so now we're going to see the story of not someone who followed all the rules, someone who was a notorious sinner, someone who was far from the Lord, but yet was drawn to the Lord. So this is what it says in Luke 19. And Jesus, he entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief collector, chief tax collector, and was rich. So again, we see the young rich ruler, and now we see the rich tax collector. His name was Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus was a, there you go, all right, wee little man was he. So we have Zacchaeus, and he's a wee little man. We're not going to go that he climbs into a tree to sycamore so he could see Jesus and, and all that good stuff. We're not going to go into that today. But he wanted to see Jesus. But the main thing I want you to hear is that he was rich, he was immoral, he was a sinner. They don't let people like that into the church. They don't let people like that into your small groups. They don't let people like that because he was a notorious sinner. We like people like the young rich ruler who follows rules and, and who does all these things. But here we go. So the, young, the, the, the people that Jesus was, again, he left because he was disappointed. His stuff was more than his Savior. Now we get a picture of a, a sinner and how when he gets an invitation to hang out with Jesus. Remember, invitation challenge, invitation challenge. Now let's, let's read. Now we're going to jump down to verse 5. Verse 5 says this, And when Jesus came to, to, to place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house. There's the invitation. So Jesus is, is, is there's an invitation to say, hey, I want to hang out with you. And look at Zacchaeus' response in verse 6. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. On the screen, uh, or if you're following along online, you'll see things underlined. I encourage you to highlight that or underline it in your word. We're going to come back to it. That's going to be one of the main topics we talk about. So he received him joyfully, hint, hint. And when he saw it, when he saw it they all grumbled. This is the religious leaders. He has gone to be with a guest of a man who is a sinner. 
And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today, today salvation has come to the house, since he is also in the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So here we see two different pictures of two different guys with a lot of money. They both receive invitations. One receives that invitation and leaves sorrowful. Another receives an invitation and receives it joyfully. So let's look at these unprecedented actions and what it means for us. So let's dive into the story of Zacchaeus. So unlike the young rich ruler, Zacchaeus has great joy. That's your first fill in the blank, is that he is joyful. He's joyful to accept that invitation of Christ you're like, wait, that can't be right. He, he's a sinner. Sinners don't like Jesus. Most sinners say, we, we, we pretty like, much like Jesus. We don't like the church. Jesus didn't wait around for people who were far from the Father to come hang out with him. They were drawn to him. They were drawn to his grace, and they were drawn to his compassion. They were drawn to his mercy. People who, who didn't know, they, they, they ran to Jesus. Too many of us in the church, we repel people who are far from the Lord. But here we see people drawn to Jesus who are joyful. And can I tell you, Jesus still invites us into things. He, he invites us into mission. He invites us into relationship. He invites us into challenges. Now, some of us just flat out say no. Other of us make excuses. But Jesus is still in the inviting business. Some of us, unlike Zacchaeus, we go, well, if you knew what I did last weekend, or if you knew my past, there's, there's no way that Jesus could call me to be a missionary. There's, there's no way Jesus could call me to start a church. There's no way Jesus would, would, would want me to, to, to start a small group or be a part of a small group if he knew. And, and Jesus invites you into things, but we either say no, or we make excuses, or we do it, and we do it begrudgingly because our hearts aren't pure. We don't do it very joyful. But here we see unprecedented response in that this notorious sinner is full of joy when he gets to hang out with Jesus. A lot of us church people, and this is one of the things we try to say here at Capstone, it's not we have to, it's I, I, I get to. Too many of us wake up on Sunday morning and, man, I've got to serve, or I've got to give, or I've got to go to group, or I've got to go to huddle, or I've got to do these things. Zacchaeus goes, man, I get to hang out with Jesus I get to worship together. Some of y'all been in quarantine. You're like, man, we are so glad we get to be here today. And there we go. Yeah, get a little life, get a little life. But the idea is, is this, is that, man, we get to, not that I have to, and that we need to have joy. And here in the unprecedented response, the actions of Zacchaeus show us, man, we need to be more joyful. The next is, is a sinner. The leaders don't like it. The religious leaders don't like it that, they, that he is hanging out with this notorious sinner, this chief tax collector. They probably didn't mind him hanging out with the young rich ruler. Why? Because he looked like the perfect candidate to be a follower of Jesus. He looked like the perfect candidate to join our church. He looked like the perfect candidate to work with our edge students. He looked like the perfect candidate to, to work at Camp Rock. He, he, he's nice and he's clean and he follows all the rules. And he says, yes, ma'am, and, and no, ma'am. And he does all the things that we expect of a good person to do. They didn't really mind Jesus hanging out with him. But in the end, Jesus and his unprecedented actions show us that he has a heart for the lost. Now, he has a heart for, the, for, for those who follow his rules, and he has a heart for the lost. He, he invites both of these guys, but only one of them says yes. But we see this notorious sinner. Jesus tells him, he says, look, I don't really care about what other people think about me. I don't really care about my reputation, because, you know, as religious people, you know, they talk about us church people who hang out with notorious sinners. They talk about us in the sense that, man, if, it, if he was a good pastor, he shouldn't be hanging out with that group. I literally had someone tell me that I was bringing the wrong type of kids into my student ministry, in my first student ministry. Those are the wrong kind of kids to be coming into this church. I kind of said, no, I'm pretty sure those are the exact ones who need to be here at the church. Jesus says, look, I've got an audience of one. It's the Father. I'm going to do what the Father tells me to go. And we should look at this and go, man, the unprecedented actions show that we need to have those who are far from the Lord close to us. Close to us. 
Jesus says in Matthew, he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Can I tell you who those workers are? Us. Can I tell you who the harvest is? Zacchaeus. And where do we find Jesus? In the harvest. Too many of us in church like to stand outside of the harvest and judge the harvest and, and cast stones at the harvest, but we don't actually have the, the courage and the obedience to go into the harvest. So we see Jesus in the harvest, passion for the sinner. All right, so we see we need to have a joyful heart, too, that we need to be a part uh, of the harvest and, and making sure that we are uh, hanging out with those who are far from the Lord. Three, we see that notorious is, uh, notorious, Zacchaeus is a giver. Luke, out of, out of the right field, we don't really know the conversation that Jesus had with Zacchaeus. We don't know what he talks about, but at, at some point, he's been having this conversation about becoming a follower. Maybe he says what he says in Luke 9, anyone who be, wishes to be a disciple of me needs to pick up their cross. So Zacchaeus kind of processes that at dinner, and he's like, man, what does that look like for me? What's it like for me to really pick up my cross? What's it like for me? He says, you know what, Jesus, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give half of my money to the poor. And we don't know if Jesus tells him to do that. Or we just don't know if this guy finally picks up what Jesus is dropping. He goes, all right, I'm going to give half of my money. And you know what? I am going to actually repay the people I've stole back. I'm going to repay them fourfold, which means if he stole 100, he's going to give them 400 back. He has got lots of money. But ultimately, he says, look, I want you, Jesus. And what you're telling me is that if I want you, I need, you need all of me. So I'm going to give you my money, I'm going to give you my time, I'm going to give my talents, I'm going to give my treasure, I'm going to give all, I am all in Jesus for what you are calling me to be. A very different response to the guy who goes to church and who follows the rules. We see this guy who on the outside is a notorious sinner, but on the inside something begins to change. And there were probably people who were like, this guy can't really really going to be a follower of Jesus. There's no way. He's too bad. He's too far. He's done too much. Jesus says, no, 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 no. This guy gets it. This guy gets it. I'm sure Jesus loves this, <laughs> that this rascal gets it. He's like, this guy, not the guy who knew all the rules. This guy gets it. Jesus says, I am here for the Zacchaeuses. And if we're followers of Christ, we need to be here for the Zacchaeuses. We need to be with those who are far from the Lord so that when they do have that revelation or when the Lord draws them near or they have that question, they don't go to the world or they don't go to Google to ask it. They look at other Christ followers and go, hey, I've got this question. Hey, I've got this crisis. Hey, I've got this problem. I know you go to church. I know you worship the uh, uh, God. Hey, can you tell me what you would do in this instance? Or, or what does Jesus say? Or what does the Bible say? Do you have people around you that would come to you seeking to find Jesus? And you can say, hey, can I point you to him? I don't necessarily have all the answers, but can I point you to him? Jesus says, look, I am here for the, uh, I am here for them. Because Jesus says, I am here for the lost, Luke 19, 10. He says, I came to seek and to save those that were lost. That, that, was a, that is a, a heartbeat of Capstone Church. When we started this church 12 years ago, we said we want to be about the lost. And so in Luke 15, Jesus says, he shares three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And we built our church on the idea that we want to celebrate the one more than the 99, most churches are built around the 99. They're, they're for church people. We said we want to equip the church people to be missionaries where they work, live, and play, and to build relationships with the Zacchaeuses, with the one. Because Jesus says himself in verse 10, Luke 19, 10, if you don't have this memorized, do. Jesus says, I came to seek and to save those that are lost. So if we're Christ followers, Jesus says, here's my mission. If we're Christians, which means little Christ, we need to have people who, the way we say it, is someone who's close to us but far from God. Who is it that's close to you but far from God? Who is it the way, that, the way that I was challenged one time was, if you prayed for a lost person last night and the Lord granted that prayer request, who would come to know Jesus today? And that's convicting because a lot of us probably didn't pray for anyone's salvation yesterday. Or we don't have a list of people who are far from the Lord but close to us. But Jesus says, I came to seek and to save those that are lost. My church should be passionate about those who are far from the Lord. So they should have these unprecedented actions to share the gospel in word and 
deed. But too many times we're attracted more to the young rich rulers than we are the Zacchaeuses as, quote unquote, church. Jesus says, I'm here for the non-church, the cheating, the cussing, the stealing, the immoral. That's the people he wants us to be hanging out with. But we're a lot like the religious leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees of going, well, if we hang out with them, we might get some of their sin on us. We'd rather follow rules than follow Jesus because we really don't want to know where Jesus is going to take us. It's so much more complicated because they don't think like us and talk like us and, and vote like us. And so there's, there's some comfort there. It's just much easier to follow the rules, just be a good person, just go to church. To have relationships with the Zacchaeus is that's messy. And it is messy. It's much easier just to live in our Christian bubble. It's much easier just to live as a family versus sharing the gospel in word and deed. Jesus says, but I came for both. As my church, you come for both. To equip the saints, Ephesians 4, and to seek and to save those that are lost, Luke 19, 10. And so what does that look like in your life? Here's my challenge for you guys. The Lord asks you to respond in some way when dealing with the lost, as who are far from the Lord. Do you respond like the young rich ruler and pout because you're not willing to sacrifice? Or are you going to be like Zacchaeus and say, you know what? I'm all in. Everything you have, everything I have is yours. My money is yours. My time is yours. My marriage is yours. My parenting is yours. My dating relationship is yours. My college education is yours. Everything I have, God, is yours. Now, what do you want me to do with it? Because when we begin to act like that, we're not just church goers, we are now Christ followers, because now we're willing to go, we're willing to be, we're willing to say, we're willing to do whatever Christ leads us to do, because I have been crucified with Christ, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Luckily, I've been able to have relationships with those who are far from the Lord, even though I'm a pastor, just to be FYI, lost people don't, are kind of suspicious of preachers. So I don't get invited to places, some places you might get invited to, because I'm a preacher. People kind of clean up their language around me because I'm a preacher. But I love it when people are real and they don't clean up their, their language. They're real about who they are. They're real with their doubts. They're real with their questions. And I've, had, I've been able to ask people, hey, why don't you, what's your view of the church? They don't go to church. And they say, well, I view the church as judging. I view them as, um, I know they're, we're known as the church as what we're, for, what we're against as opposed to what we're for. They separate themselves from us. They have no desire to know the Christ that we love because we as the church have failed to take unprecedented action to love more than hate, to listen more than debate, to laugh more than scream and argue. We as the church have failed in our unprecedented actions. We chase after the young rich rulers who follow rules than getting messy with the Zacchaeuses. So what does that look like in your life? Because I've seen over the years that when we do that, when we do these unprecedented actions, it draws the loss like Zacchaeus in. And man, yeah, we go to drug court with people and we pay people's bills and we get, in, get involved in lots of messy stuff and, and we go to rehab and take people to rehab and we do all these things because it is so messy. But can I tell you the fruit that has come for a decade of doing that just in our own little church? People look to us and have conversations like this. Well, I don't believe in God, and I don't go to church. But if I went to church, I go to Capstone because I know some. I know people who go there, and they've been able to hang out, and and they're real, and they're honest, and and, and so that does my heart well when I hear the law speak well of our gospel community of going, man, I know your church, and and your church is pretty neat. And that when they have crisis, guess who they might come to us. When they have questions, they might come to. The church, but if we're not in the harvest, we can't be there to answer their questions. We're, if we're not there, we can't point them in the right direction. So we've got to have those unprecedented actions. Here's our big idea again. If you're new to Capstone, we try to give uh, just one tag that you can you can post on Twitter or social media, or that you can bring up at lunch with your grandma. Say, hey, "Here's what I learned at church today." So here it is. It's this: the unprecedented actions of the church point the lost to Christ. So we've got to be a part of the unprecedented actions, not what the world expects us to do to judge, to hate, to debate, to argue. The idea that we would love, that we would listen, that we would laugh. That our unprecedented actions and his unprecedented love for them and their salvation. So when we have unprecedented actions, we are able to share the love that Christ has for the lost 
and hopefully bring in and usher in salvation. That's our job as the church. Jesus says, I came to seek and to save those that are lost. So for some of you, you need to begin to process that. Hey, who is in my life that's close to me but far from God? Who is it that I'm praying for? Who is it I'm building relationships for? Who am I, is it that I'm in the harvest? How am I in the harvest? How am I intentionally engaging with lostness? Because guess what? When your light goes into the dark, everything is brighter around it. I, I literally had someone who, who's, who's pretty far from the Lord. They said, hey, well, hanging out with you makes me a better person because every time they would start to cuss, they'd stop. I go, dude, that's not why I'm hanging out with you is, is not for you to make a better person. I'm hanging out with you because I, I enjoy hanging out. I enjoy, hopefully, you seeing Jesus in what I do. But who are those people? Who are those stories? Who are the ones that's in your life? That you man, And it might be just simply inviting someone over for dinner who doesn't go to church. It, it might be inviting that person to, 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 uh, to lunch. It might be not going, I can't believe I got to go on that business trip with that guy. As opposed to go, man, I get to go on the business trip with that guy, and I get to be Jesus to that woman, or I get to hang out with that person on that teammate, or sit beside them on the bus, or whatever that might be. What does that look like in your life that you don't go, man, I don't I have to share the gospel with people? Which some of us grew up in church, and that's the way it was. We had evangelism training, and we would go knock on doors, and we would give out pamphlets, and we'd do stuff like that because we had to share the gospel. He says, no, no, you don't have to share the gospel. Get to share the gospel through your actions and through your words and through what I am doing in and through you. So as we kind of wrap up this unprecedented series, what unprecedented actions do you need to take? It might be claiming that first week of the unprecedented identity in Christ. For some of you, your, your, your identity is more in what you do and what you've done versus what Christ has done for you and your call to live as a missionary where you work, live, and play. For some, you need to move from friend to faith, to family some of you just are looking for, you know, acquaintances at church. But Jesus says, hey, I, I went to the cross for more than just friends at church. I, I went for you to be a family on mission. You might be getting engaged or start serving here at Capstone or beginning to say, hey, how can I get to know some more people here and really share my heart and soul with what God's doing here? Or it might be like we talked about today that you need to shock those who are far from the Lord with your actions. You need to stop being a hypocrite. You need to start ju- stop judging you need to go, well, I don't agree with you, so I'm not going to listen. Maybe you can, you know what, I don't agree with you, but I still want to listen. Because I want to hear your problems. I want to hear your brokenness. I want to hear that, because ultimately I want to hear that, and I want to, I want to be in a relationship, so when you come searching, or I can at least point you, going, hey, I may not know all the answers, but one of the answers is this, is a guy named Jesus. And we see throughout Scripture and throughout church history that when people see that, salvation comes rushing in. That we would hopefully have the heart of Jesus, because we're a reflection of Christ. And as we head into this time of response, that that we we want you guys to begin to process, hey, what actions do I need to take? How do I move from friend to family? And how am I picking up that cross daily? And how that overflows into these 21 days of prayer that that we've been on. We've been on this, this journey and so kind of as we kind of now transition into that, here, here's what I want to say. Um, one, as you came in, there's, there's a communion cup in front of you. And, and communion is, is, is what we call a sacrament of the church. And, and sacraments are meant to, to draw us closer in. And so hopefully in this journey, whether it was just today, this is the first time you've been here, the first time you've heard this series, or this journey that you've been with us on 21 days of prayer for t- first the 21 days heading into 2021, but God's been working on you and we're kind of, we're, we're turning a page and heading into a new series next week and, and, and moving in. We, we just want to remember what Christ has done for us. So you've got a, uh, a portable thing because normally we would have bread and we'd have juice and because of the pandemic, we can't do communion like we've always done. So we get these wonderful styrofoam pieces that we, that we take and we drink this cough syrup. <laughs> communion is not meant to taste good, by the way. But we've got these, and we're thankful for it. We don't have to. We get to take communion. And so as we do that, we we pray that you'd remember that that Christ has given his body for you, that he has shed his blood to wash away your sins. And, And this is meant to be for Christ followers. If you're not a Christ follower, this is not for you. If you've yet to make that decision, this is not for you. This is for those who are part of Christ's family. 
So we want you to spend some time in confession maybe or just kind of remembering it. And, and we're going to ask you in, in the next two songs, whether you do it in the quiet time or you do it during a song, you may not stand up, you just may need to pray. We ask that you would do that. So, so this would be a time that we would take communion together uh, in this next thing as you see fit. The second thing we want you to do is in this 21 days of prayer, uh, hopefully you've heard the Lord move. God has challenged you. So again, we can't have you respond and come up here and do lots of cool stuff. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to respond in your seat. And everyone should have one of these second service. You might have to work a little bit harder to find one. But we want you to write down, here's where I saw the Lord move. Here's what God said to me. Here's a prayer that I saw answered. Here's where God challenged me. Here's where God invited me. Here's where God is working. We want you to write that down. Document it and to share with the world. If you're watching online, we're gonna ask that you would do that in the comments. So if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and, and open up Facebook and, and that you would go ahead in the comments and say, hey, here's where God spoke. Here's where God challenged me. Here's where God is moving. For those who are here at 601 Fairview Street, we're gonna ask that you would put it in the box as you leave. And when you come in next week, we're gonna have these displayed. We, you might come a little early because we want you to take some time to, to read to hear how your brothers and sisters have heard from the Lord, to, to see what God is doing in a mighty way. You see scripture up here from last night's time that we had here of just personal revival, of how is God, at, how is God instructing you just not to pray, but to be an answer to prayer. Just don't pray for someone's salvation. Share the gospel with them. Don't just pray for the oppressed. Be the answer to someone's oppression. Don't just pray for teachers. Bless a teacher. How is God asking you to move just beyond praying into your actions, unprecedented actions, to share the gospel in word and deed? So you can do that again online. Put those in the comments for us. If you're here, just take a few minutes and, and write these down. You can put those over there. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to have a, just a, a minute of silence or two, and then we're going to go into some more songs. Again, you may not sing with us. You may need to just sit in prayer. Well, however God leads, we pray that you would, you would go. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now and we're just asking for the Holy Spirit to move. We know that Holy Spirit, you were here. So we just ask that we would have the ears to hear and our hearts would be soft. God, that we would not have the response of the young rich ruler when whatever you're putting on someone's heart right now, that they would leave saddened. But God, we pray that we would respond like Zacchaeus and respond and hear with joyful, joyful anticipation of an invitation it might be an invitation to build a relationship with someone who's lost. It, it might be an invitation to become more from, more of a family than friendship. It, it might be an invitation to be more intimate with you through word and through prayer. But God, whatever that invitation moment is in right here, I pray that we would respond in obedience. So God, just as we see these verses on the screen, as we see promptings too on the screen, as we just kind of allow the Holy Spirit to move, I pray that we would have the ears to hear and that our hearts would be fertile soil, and that we would see much fruit from these 21 days of prayer, but not only that, but that we would see much fruit from just simply unprecedented action of your church to move in mighty ways, to be obedient, to sacrifice, to pick up our cross and to follow you. Your son's holy name. Amen. so glad that you have joined us online to worship with our capstone family here was today's big idea the unprecedented actions of the church point the loss to christ and his unprecedented love for them and their salvation to seek and to save those who are lost 
As his children, we must live lives that are unprecedented in order to point others to Christ. This means listening more than debating, loving more than hating, and laughing more than screaming. We as the church must have a heart for the lost, sacrifice for the lost, and share the gospel with them in word and deed to those who are far from the Lord. Again, thank you for watching online. We would love to connect with you. You can connect via our social media platforms, our website, capstonechurch.net, or we would love to see you in person in one of our future gatherings. You guys are sent out.